Good morning guys and welcome back to another video. We have actually just got back from a trip. We've been away for 10 days. We drove to Florence and back for my very good friend Nancy's wedding. It was absolutely beautiful and it was just yeah a really nice adventure. Nice to kind of take a little bit of a break and come back feeling even more excited for our projects here and coming back to the land it was just so beautiful it was like really warm really quiet after being in a big crazy city and all the mimosa is in blossom so it just smelt amazing yeah i think a trip always reminds you of how nice home is so we're actually just gonna sit down today and answer a few questions we mentioned a few videos ago we were going to do a q a in celebration of hitting 20,000 subscribers which is just mind-boggling thank you all so much for being here and thank you for everyone who submitted questions we've had loads of great ones we're gonna sit down and answer some of those for you hello <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous isn't it? it's actually it is. really cold in the morning and at night but lovely now yeah um so yeah thank you for your questions and um i'll start we had the first one from Abby and Dave from Vision Portugal Dream. What are your top tips for people thinking of moving to Portugal to live? Don't do it, no. yeah. <laughs> definitely do it. I think one of the biggest shocks, at least for me, and I think I can speak for both of us, was how hot and hard the summer was. That was a real shock to the system. And counteractively, how cold the winters have been that night, actually. Yeah. Like the extreme of the temperature from 45 in the summer to minus three in the winter, like that's quite hard to cater to yeah. with your house and clothing. Um, yeah, I would say that's a big tip. If you re like, if you don't like the heat, then definitely come and test it out. And like, I mean, if you're going to go full off grid, then obviously you're at the, the mercy of the seasons anyway. But if you've got an apartment or something, you've got air con. Then I imagine it's a different question, isn't it? Yeah. Or a different answer, anyway. I'd probably say my top tip would be, especially if you're moving somewhere rural, is to try and learn as much Portuguese as you can before you get here. Because though quite a lot of people do speak English, I think it does just very quickly make things a lot easier the more you can communicate with um, people, <laughs> yeah. basically. Uh, I think learning a language is incredibly hard but if you just start with like one of the apps like memorize and just get some vocabulary in i think that will really help you feel more at home here but yeah top tip just do it it's an absolutely brilliant place to live people are really friendly and the weather is great when yeah. it's not too hot <laughs> like we did no pl prior planning or re like we, we planned it i guess but we hadn't we didn't do much preparation we didn't come here the first time we came to portugal we bought a place yeah. a month later yeah so. we basically decided in september 2020 oh should we move to portugal and six weeks later we're here so <laughs> maybe do more planning than we did would be a tip <laughs> yeah but it will work yeah just take the plunge yeah next question kaz asked how did you go about changing the barn from rustic to urban is it pre-1951 i find it all a bit con confusing in regards to what you can and can't do. I think this is quite a complex issue <laughs> that a and lot of people... a great question. Yeah. Goes probably. back to the preparation from the previous question. This is something to bear in mind. <laughs> we lucked out, actually. Our barn is already on a small urban article. This is within the deed, so most... Very loud bird. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can still hear me over that. Most... Pieces of land like this are rustic. A lot of people choose these kind of buildings because they tend to be on urban and therefore you can live within them. I just think the best bit of advice is when you're looking at a piece of land, ask for the information on the deeds. I would say use a lawyer, but that doesn't always guarantee that things will go swimmingly, as you all know if you followed our story, but it's definitely more helpful <laughs> to yeah. try and, and do things like that. So there's a document that you have to have from the camera to confirm that this is a pre-1951 building so make sure you have that official document as well yeah. and yeah it was already an urban article. I don't know the process of turning something from rustic to urban. Yeah sorry. <laughs> no experience <laughs> of it. No. Try and do some research in the rules and 
hope for the best. <laughs> and the next question from Gorgeous with the next one. <laughs> oh, we have quite a lot of questions from you. So first question. What are your plans for the more recent land purchase? Anything specific to be grown there, like the pond, maybe fish? I'm guessing you mean the land purchase as the second half of land that we had to buy. If you watch our previous video, we did a land tour, if none of this is making sense to you. And we did talk a little bit about our plans for that piece of land. But no, we've, we've not really specifically... No, decided. definitely a pond. Yeah. Not yeah. sure when. Yeah. And we'll have to dig it by hand at the moment, so... <laughs> Not much chance anytime soon. Um, but yeah, we, we only bought that piece of land to confirm that the house would be ours. I mean, it's full of olives and vines already as well. Yeah. But yeah, you can go back and watch our previous land tour video and we explain a lot our plans for the land. Second question, what happened to the wild lavender patch, which was also a shaded area? It was mentioned early on. I think you are talking about a part in the nugget. Again, you'll understand the nugget from the land tour. And there's lots of wild lavender just growing down there under the cork oak. I will do some b-roll now of it. <laughs> Still there, but it's yeah really far away from, from the house where we park the car so we don't spend too much time there. So I'm gonna go get some cuttings from yeah. Lavender actually from there. Three, what are you looking to preserve more of this year given the new cooker? <gasps> we love our new cooker. Yeah. We're gonna look at canning, aren't we? Yeah, especially tin tomatoes. Yeah. Because that's something we eat a lot of. Um, and we can grow quite easily. Mm. We did sun dries in the first year. They were amazing and they lasted so long. So we'll definitely do them again. We'll definitely try some tomato sauces. Mm -hmm. I'd like to try dried figs this year, mm. if we actually get any, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Um, someone in the comments did mention about dried raisins, which is a brilliant idea. The problem is with our grapes is they're wine grapes. So each grape has got like five or six seeds in it. So in order to do raisins, it would be quite a lot of like surgical work to remove the <laughs> seeds from each grape. We do have two, I think, or three seedless varieties in pots or in the ground already. So once they get fruitful, then we'll definitely be experimenting with that. Mm. What else? I think we'll just, it, it depends what grows, because each year is different. The first year yeah. we had a lot of success and then this year was really hard to actually grow things. So anything that we get an abundance of, we will attempt to preserve in some way <laughs> or another. Diogo chasing some else. I would really like to also try some sauerkraut this year because cabbage grows really, really well here. Lots of things, really. It's going to be a, a learning curve yeah. for us. Um, More alcohol. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We want to try uh, quince wine and yeah. make things um, with the fruit and stuff. The hoopoe is back. Yeah. This is the first time we've heard the hoopoe bird and yeah, it's like a, a sound <laughs> that is like the backdrop to living here. Brilliant noise. Yeah. Um, fourth question, what products of the land would you sell if you could? Wine, 100%. We will be. Yeah. Um, we have quite a lot of olive oil when we do have a good harvest, so if we have an excess of that, we'll be selling that. I'm going to be really embarrassed because our neighbours are driving past. Oh, you never get used to uh, filming yourself. <laughs> yeah, we didn't pick olives this year and we still have plenty left from the first year. So if we continue to have... Oh yeah, if we had a bumper harvest every year. Yeah, then yeah. we would have plenty. Yeah. So yeah, olive oil. I would really like to be growing things that we can sell as tea. I mean, even like olive leaf tea is supposed to be very good for you and we have a lot of olive leaves so yeah I think eventually just like dry dried herbs that you can use for teas I one of the plans for the uh, second piece of land would be a tea field if it does grow so yeah you never know that would be an amazing thing to be able to do is make our own tea here and we have an excess of quinces so yeah anyone ever wanted some quinces i don't think we'd sell them you can have them <laughs> and the fifth question is when will we taste the wine well we have done some sneaky sampling the general rule is you should wait until the march of the following year after harvest that's northern hemisphere of course so next month yeah i mean it tastes really good so far it tastes mm -hmm. a lot better than our first year did which is good um, we currently have about 160 liters that we'll bottle straight up and then some others that are in demijohns that probably won't make it into bottles, but you never know. <laughs> but yeah, it's good. It's tasting good. 
Yep. So uh, we'll film when we're tasting that and yep. bottling that all up. Yep. Which should be soon. And then how long will we leave it in the bottles to mature? As long as possible. Yeah. It, it depends on our patience levels, really, <laughs> and how good it tastes when it's young. Choose Fanas 54 um, said a couple of videos ago you showed us your favourite gardening tool. And what is it? It's called a Hori Hori. I'll put a link in our description. It is the best tool. Everyone in the garden should have one. It's like a Japanese tool. And then also my gardening boots with the fabric piece on top. They come from Decathlon. So it's one of the sports shops in Castello Branco. And they are they are really great, really comfy. But... All the locals wear them as well. Yeah. They're like agricultural Ugg boots, I think. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Chanier asked what are the two plant books you use? I saw them in a recent vlog. I will put some b-roll pictures of them over now so you can see. They're absolutely brilliant. These are the flower identity books that I have. Uh, this one by Octopus. Um, and then this one also called Wildflowers, again by Octopus. This one's brilliant. It's done, it's colour coded by the colour of the flower or plant. And then this is a Portuguese one. It's been really helpful to have, also for helping to learn the names of the plants. So yeah, I think if you just Google that you should find it. Also a great book. Still got a lot to learn about plant identification. Do you want to read some questions? Should I do the Instagram ones? Okay, yeah, let's, let's do some Instagram ones. If I could just take a quick minute of your time to tell you about today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is a brilliant all-in-one platform whose mission is to empower individuals to create a powerful online presence. Whether you're a content creator, have something to sell or something to say, they have a beautiful template to suit you and the brand you're building. Whether you'd like to create a blog or set up an online shop, it can be beautifully done with Squarespace. One thing I'm absolutely loving at the moment, and I've shared about this before, is being able to use that app on my phone. We had a long journey the other day and I was able to comfortably sit and work from my phone, watching the world go by and writing our first blog post. The design tools were simple to use and I could upload images directly from my phone camera roll onto my site. You'll find a link to squarespace.com in our description below, which you can head to for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Frankie Offgrid to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video and continuing to support our project. You get um, some funny names with Instagram ones as well. <laughs> yeah, we did put a, a question box up for Instagram questions and then we haven't been able to access the questions. So I put up another one last night. So if we've missed your question because you asked previously, I apologise. Add it in the comments and we'll answer it in the comments if you like. Yeah, or in the next video or yeah. something. Right then. Flipflop67kk. <laughs> Great name. Where do all the furry family sleep at night? Right, this is quite complicated. <laughs> We'll start with the princess. Yeah, Frankie sleeps in our bed most nights. Sometimes she does choose to go in the kitchen. Yeah, but yeah, she is our hot water bottle. <laughs> in the summer, actually, she doesn't sleep no. with us. But yeah, she sleeps in bed with us in the cabin. Diogo sleeps in the kitchen on the sofa. The sofa is his spot. Um, sometimes with cats, sometimes without cats. Yeah, the... because the cats mostly like to do what they want. So yeah, the cats kind of do their own thing, but they mostly, I think they, I think Albie actually sleeps underneath the cabin most yeah. nights, or we've got like an old down jacket in the barn for them to sleep in. I think Samal sleeps in the barn. Um, and the chickens obviously in their chicken coop. <laughs> <laughs> Not in bed. Yeah. <laughs> right then, Jor and Sam, we'll just stop at that. Um, hi, how well integrated and accepted do you feel with the Portuguese people? Yeah, pretty. Yeah. Yeah, the Portuguese are very welcoming, hospitable people. We Just put yourself out there. Like, as we go to the pastelaria, we go to our cafe, we, like, we go to the local yeah. areas, we interact with the community. Yeah. And, the, yeah, they welcomed us in with yeah. open arms and, um, yeah, we feel really lucky to, to be here in such a, a lovely community. All our neighbours are really friendly. They bring us... Oh, food that is delicious. One of our neighbours is an amazing cook. Her rice pudding is 
Yeah. So good. And those tempered aubergines. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so getting distracted by food. Uh, we, yeah, we spend a lot of time at our local cafe, which has been amazing. And probably I would go back to the first question as the top tip would be spend as much time as you can in one of, if you're, if you're in a smaller town, in one of your cafes. And yeah, you'll, you'll build a really good community. Yeah. And our friends who have the cafe speak really good English as well. So they've really helped us out when we've needed um, things translating and help with a lot of things. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. They're after a few drinks, like chatting to the locals, <laughs> yeah. you know, like chatting to us about the kings and queens of England and stuff like that. And football. And football. Um, so yeah, no, we, we feel really, really welcome here, which is lovely. Right. Kitty the English cat. Great thing. What has been the hardest thing to adapt to living off grid? Um, I think we never were like, we want to live off grid. We just wanted to live rurally. So I don't think we did much planning um, as to what needs resolving. So I think the hardest thing has been the knowledge gap of like having all these things to resolve how to get water how to get electricity how to be warm how to build like all the um yeah all the knowledge you need takes a long time to accrue and so for example i think like having running water is probably quite a simple system we could put together but it's just just don't have the knowledge of how that works and the confidence to do it or you might spend on it and do it wrong so it's you, you hold back a little bit so i think yeah. the hardest thing is actually just learning because most things are quite easy to resolve um we lived in a van for about four months Simi, and i think that's a really good learning experience for living like this because you are off good in a van and you have to think about collecting drinking water and your electrical needs and then i think probably the very first thing to adapt to was having electricity because we both work online i think if we didn't work online it wouldn't have been as stressful but no. trying to keep a laptop charged when all we had was the van battery and we weren't driving very far and you need your phones to do the laptop yeah. internet yeah um yeah it's quite complicated so. i would say that's probably yeah one of the things we we struggled with the most and now we have lots of power banks which is absolutely amazing yeah. we've been really lucky that so many power bank companies have wanted to work with us because that has just made life a lot easier but yeah i think we're just quite good at roughing it so yeah yeah using a bucket as a loo and <laughs> being cold and having down jackets has been really good and i think being in portugal probably makes a huge difference because like it's February yeah. Mm, yeah like it's gorgeous whereas if you were in Wales doing this mm. it'd be raining and blowing a gale so it'd be a totally totally different experience so yeah I think the weather has a huge impact on your on your comfort so we obviously we have the extreme heat of the summer to deal with so that is quite hard like not having air con <laughs> in 40, 40, 45 degrees Celsius heat but yeah I, th I actually think that most things are really easy to resolve though time consuming yeah like going to collect our drinking water and having to be reactive of being like oh, have we got enough water is the solar charging Go on, helps. yeah it does it actually is very time consuming Ooh. when you don't have those conveniences so yeah it's probably like time management yeah, <laughs> is yeah. one of the challenges as well but. right next question uh moog wills have you got any processionary caterpillars on your land? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, no, because we don't have any pine trees. No. So they li tend to live in a specific pine. There are some there. There's a forest there right behind us, and there are a few nests in there. And on the piece of land next to us by the car, there is a couple of small pine trees, and there's one there. But we've never seen them on the ground. We actually haven't seen any yet this year. I know some of our friends have. Seen some in a tree. Yeah. But that's it. But luckily, no. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> right, Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Um, what's your favourite season in Portugal? Mine's spring. Yeah. Because everything's coming back to life and you see all the buds bursting and everything goes into blossom. Yeah, spring is Definitely. absolutely stunning here. March is probably my favourite. The weather is really nice. I'm really hoping this wind isn't causing trouble. Mm -hmm. um, Talk a bit louder. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 100% spring. March, the month of March is 
gorgeous, it's really exciting time in the garden, the weather's perfect, the nights aren't as cold. But a very, very close second is autumn, because yeah. it's like the relief of from summer. That first rain. Yeah, on that first like day where you feel like almost cold. Yeah. For like the first day in four months that your body's at a normal temperature, you know what I mean? And they do call it a second spring the autumn here because everything pretty much uh, pretty much dies in the summer and then the or because winter isn't as harsh, you know, you can start planting the garden again, the sheep have lambs. So yeah, October and March, the best, best here. Right. Paula Pinto Carvalho. <laughs> Do you see yourself staying in Portugal forever? Well, at the moment, I can't see why not. No, I, d I mean, you never know what life is yeah. going to, where life is going to lead you, but it would take a lot to make us leave, I think. Yeah. We absolutely love it here. I think the one thing we both miss a lot is the sea. Yeah, for sure. So if we did move, it would be to the coast, but it would probably be to the Portuguese coast. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, we're pretty sailed. We got our residency like fully confirmed about a month ago. Yeah. Um, we got our, our residency cards. cards. So yeah, we're here for five years for sure. <laughs> and then yeah, hopefully we'll be able to renew that and eventually we'll probably apply for our citizenship here. Yeah. So, yeah. As, as far as we know, yes. <laughs> oh, and another question from Paula. Are babies in the future plans? <laughs> Currently not. I think we'll go for running water and electricity first. <laughs> That's as far as we've got, really. Yeah, I think we both are on the same page that it's having kids is not something that's really important to us, but it's something we would enjoy doing. So, yeah, we make no plans for it currently. Uh, if it happened, I think we would just see it as a, a great life experience. If, if that's the way to put it. <laughs> <I don't know>. Adventure? <laughs> An adventure. For a long time I was very against having children. I really didn't want them. Um, now my sister has two that I absolutely adore. That slightly changed my mind. But yeah, I, th I think life without children would be wonderful. With children would also be wonderful. So in a nutshell, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Heart White House. Have you noticed a positive impact on your mental well-being since living off-grid? Yes, 100%. Although at the same time, the last two years have been very stressful yeah. in a lot of different ways. So I think there has been a lot of um, moments of extreme stress. But when we're not in those, then it's very calming here. No, no. <laughs> Just run off to the bag. Are you a silly boy? <laughs> okay, we moved inside as it's a lot windier than I thought it was going to be. So did we finish that last question? Yeah, living here is very calming when there's not stuff going on. So yeah, I would say mental health is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> laughing. Right, that's it for Instagram. So, water goo, I think is how you say. A question that I've been pondering over living in France, why can't you get your beloved van matriculated into Portugal? <sighs> stress. This is one of the stresses. Yes, this is one through. of the big stresses. <laughs> so, if you're going to do it, I would definitely recommend purchasing a vehicle in your home country before you come. Make sure that vehicle is good. Like... <laughs> You don't, doesn't, it's not going to need any work doing to it. You're not going to have to plow a load of money into it. Like the problem we had with the van is when we started the matriculation process originally, it was during COVID, we didn't have our residency and the van was also deteriorating quite quickly, which ended up, and this is no fault of our own, we had it serviced regularly during this time. It's been to so many mechanics trying to find out what was a dodgy math sensor. Basically, we um, you have a one year deadline to get it in for tax free, which we missed because our residency took a long time to come through because of COVID and CEF, which is the organisation that deals with residency being dissolved at the time. So we then missed that. We then thought that it would be a ridiculous amount of money to matriculate it when it's not tax free. But when we actually did the research, we found out that it was going to be about 1800 in tax and the prices of cars in Portugal are extortionate. So that weirdly did actually make sense to invest the three grand it would have taken to matriculate it. And then the engine died. Yeah, and then we, there was just so many problems with the van, so we, so we stopped. 
basically. But yeah. It's a um, sore subject. Yeah, good luck if you're currently trying to matriculate a vehicle. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that would be advice is buy a solid car before you come and as soon yes. as you arrive, get it matriculated ASAP yeah. before you then spend two grand on the car and then you have to spend the extra two grand on the matriculation depending on what the vehicle is, etc, etc. Yeah. Yagi Deggs uh, says, are you still going to knock down your walled water tank thing? And if so, is that an idea you could live to regret in the future? While it may need some work, it's surely a point of difference that could maybe be used for many different things going forward. Yeah, we are definitely going to knock it down. It is actually just um, quite a simply built structure that we could yeah. easily reconstruct. Uh, it's We've put a lot of work into trying to fix the leak in it and I don't think putting any more work into it yeah. makes sense. To actually fix it properly we would have to knock down the whole thing and mm. rebuild it anyway because the, 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 the foundation that it's on has sunk in one corner so when it fills with water the weight drops the bricks and it cracks in the bricks so it's never going to work in its current format yeah. and it's in a pretty annoying place yeah. and it's also pretty small so we're going to make a bigger one yeah. in a more suitable location. Yeah. But so. yeah, it is actually brilliant for the summer. The first summer it was great and then this summer it just didn't hold the water and water is very uh, important in the summer so mm -hmm. it's a big waste. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely be doing one. So. Yeah, yeah. You do Before need, the summer. You need water in the summer to sit in, it's, it's amazing. Kathy C says, if you started this adventure all over again, knowing what you know, what would you do differently? Import the van. <laughs> <laughs> I think something that's made it a little bit stressful for us is that we didn't have as much time to think things through because we kind of rushed here because of Brexit being on the horizon and it being a pandemic we were like let's just go and see what happens. If I was going to do it differently I'd probably spend like a year <laughs> <laughs> learning what you need to live off grid and all the ins and outs of like rules in Portugal and yeah, things like learning that. Learning how solar works. But I also think if you overthink things, sometimes you don't do it. And I think our kind of naive jumping in has, you figure things out as you go along. So maybe that, otherwise, yeah, nothing really. Mm. Um, I think we, you always say you win some, you learn some. So anything that's been difficult has been an opportunity to learn, even if at the time it's very stressful. Um, but I, I absolutely love the piece of land we have. Mm -hmm. I love that it's now bigger, even though that was a stressful thing. It's made our land like feel more complete. So yeah, it's just seeing the silver linings in mm -hmm. all the things. Yeah, you've got to really. Like if you can't, if you always put a, a negative spin on everything, then everything's going to kind of feel negative, isn't yeah. it? We make sure we do the opposite, and mm -hmm. no matter what madness happens, we always seem to come out of it. Yeah. In a good mood, at least. So. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we did say we might have done was to have spent like the first six months maybe renting somewhere rather than trying to live so uncomfortably on the land. Even first six weeks yeah. would have made us made yeah. up made it a lot more comfortable for us because we arrived. Well, we got the place like first of December, pretty much. Yeah, and just, it rained for a month. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't like. I think if you had like a properly well kitted out van you would be comfortable but ours mm -hmm. just wasn't but then I think we wouldn't have like learned the land and what we needed as much so then we were kind of like no maybe that that discomfort was kind of yeah worth what we learned at the time yeah so. for sure Meg Lange Lange I think sorry if I'm saying your name wrong mm -hmm. Meg one was I often wish for you that you had a small tractor with a wagon and mower to make some of your work easier is that a possibility in the not too distant future yeah so I hope so I'm terrified of riding one. I think I'll just roll it and end up killing myself. But yeah, um, yeah, we'd like to get one. Maybe yeah. mostly just for a mower. Maybe with a slight tilling attachment for when we dig the vines up and stuff, or plant the vines. Yeah, it's just quite low on the priority yeah. list, isn't it? Because I think obviously it costs quite a lot of money. And yeah. We want a roof before we want a tractor. Yeah, but yeah, eventually maybe. I mean, our land actually isn't that big that the no. work like you can strim it in like five days. A quad bike would probably be more useful, actually. Yeah, for trans uh, yeah transporting stuff from the car up to the house is quite um, difficult. So yeah. doing that in a wheelbarrow, even just like the gas bottles, is it's making us very strong. <laughs> um, and then Meg's second question was, what are your top priorities to accomplish this year? We have one yeah. that we really want to do is to be sleeping in the barn room by next winter and not in the cabin, if not before then. Excitingly, that is looking... Yeah. like it could be happening quite quickly 
if we can get the roof on before summer. Yeah, that would be the absolute dream aim yeah. is to get the roof on before summer, even if it's just an extra sheltered space from the sun. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be a game changer. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's our big one is to just yeah get to work on on next door really, yeah. and then just carrying on with everything else really. Our Olney says, did you find it easy to build a community there, and how did you meet people? We found it very easy. Yeah, um, we're kind of out well outgoing people anyway. Yeah, um, um, I call myself a sociable introvert. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I need time by myself, but I really love people. Uh, I think being on YouTube, <laughs> instantly uh, you find a lot of people. And yeah, going to our local cafe and talking to the neighbours, we definitely now have a really good community around mm -hmm. us, people we can rely on, someone that will come and feed the cats when we go away or pull your car out of a ditch mm -hmm. <laughs> just like the first month we lived here. Yeah, it's been really easy. There's a huge immigrant community here and then the Portuguese. So yeah, super easy yeah. and wonderful. Martin Chavez says, I hope they said your name right. Uh, at any point in time, have you considered this is all too much and thought about going back to your old lives or just start anew in a regular homestead town? Not necessarily back in Wales, but maybe still in Portugal or somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. I think there's probably been about four times in the last couple of years where we've both just gone, This is mad. What are we doing? Sh shall we just go back to a normal life, get a normal job? live in a normal house and just, yeah. <laughs> but we always just come, like the conversation always just leads back to, no, we love like the, the potential for the life we're building here is just incredible. And most of the time it's wonderful in the present as well. So yeah, I think anytime you do something a little bit out of the ordinary, you're gonna question whether you're doing the right thing. In the bad times. Yeah, yeah. That's it, it is like a proper ebbs and flows yeah. thing. Um, like summertime, you're like, mm, this is too hot. Yeah, yeah the <laughs> summer is definitely like, yeah, extreme. But that does come through infrastructure. So having the roof yeah. on the kitchen made a huge difference yeah. this year. Having the roof on the barn will make a huge difference yeah. this year, last year. This even year. though <laughs> this summer was harsher than the first one, that this summer was easier yeah. because this room was better infrastructured and we had electricity to run a fan. But yeah, there's been plenty of times we've, we've thought this is way too much. And, but we're still here. Yeah. A mile here. <laughs> Anna Dowdy says, um, do you plan on starting work on the other half of your home this year? Um, yeah, as yep. just said. David and Sophia from Escape to the Kinta says, uh, what was the first day and week and month like? We're soon to be making the move and without power and water, what was it like initially? And is there something you would have done differently or brought with you if you could do it all again? All in all, it was hilarious. Got the van stuck twice. Yeah. Had to build driveway. So we moved in at the very end of November on a very wet day, um, completely unprepared. The first day was uh, horrendous. To be honest. Well, we thought we were prepared. We had like little tracks, you know, like these little things uh, that you can have underneath your driver's seat, and you just get them out and peg them into the so you, so you can stop like get out from being stuck yeah. not a chance so we were stuck here for two days um <laughs> unexpectedly uncertain if we'd be able to get the van back off the land and we were in this room the roof was like leaking there were frogs walking into the room it's like a picture up it was freezing cold and we, we didn't have a heater we were just in all our down jackets and layers and we had a little like camp stove trying to cook dinner um we couldn't even like have a fire outside because it was raining so much. So, uh, yeah, that was intense. Yes, yeah. back to the Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. First week in an Airbnb would have been a lot easier. Good. But it makes a great story. Yeah. Now. Then we kind of the first week again was just baptism of fire. Yeah, and then actually before the end of the first month, we actually had to go back to the UK. Yeah, we didn't did. We? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I lost my granddad, so um, yeah, we had to go back for that. So it was just, oh, it was just a very intense time yeah. for many, many reasons. So I think probably not moving in during the storm, which I think Ken and Gina of OK Portugal did, yeah, they the, did same. the same. They moved into yeah. their farm like in the midst of a crazy storm. So maybe that's just how you have to move somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the depths of COVID as well. So like, I think Portugal had just gone back into a full lockdown. The UK was about to. Yeah. We had to go through France and Spain in like a day. 
Yeah. Like, it's absolute carnage. So yeah, circumstances were difficult, but I think if, if there wasn't all that going in, going on, yeah, I think just buckle yourself in for a <laughs> ride and you, you Enjoy just, it. you don't know what to expect, everyone's experience is going to be different, so yeah, just, just expect anything and um, I don't know if you can prepare for that, but I think one of the things, if we could bring something with us, would have been like one of the power banks that we have. Um, because our van electricity wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. Down sleeping bags and jackets if yeah. you're coming in the winter. I and... left all my warm mountain stuff in Wales. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Be prepared for all eventualities. Yeah, yeah. Juliet Kemp says, Hi there, I've often wondered what the Portuguese neighbours think of the new English, Welsh, South African, etc. neighbours. Do they mind what? Um, do they mind that you're all moving in or do they think you're all weirdos? Um, they probably do think we're yeah, all It's probably weird. a bit of both, yeah. Yeah, just because, I think as well because a lot of people are moving into these sort of abandoned buildings and just, yeah, they probably do think we're weird. But as far as our experience has been, and I, I think someone actually commented on this question saying it hugely matters on how respectful you are as a person moving in and as long as you are respectful, I think yeah. you're always going to be welcomed. This yeah. If you've been here for eight years and you don't speak the language and you don't interact no with the community, etc., then you're obviously going to be looked at as an outsider because yeah. you've made yourself an outsider. Yeah. Or if you just kind of are disrespectful of the traditions here or the way of life or you're very illegally building things, then yeah, you might not be very welcome. But I think that would be anywhere. Yeah. Um, but I think especially this region that we're in, in the central um, Portugal is, what's the word? Desertified. Desertified of people. So uh, it's one of the, you know, they're losing a lot of their population to the cities because there's no jobs here. So a lot of the land is being abandoned. So I actually hope and I think that they're really happy to see people coming in and uh, looking after the land. They always ask us about kids and I think it's because of the amount of kids that are in the schools is so they're yeah. having to close down the local schools and the local villages so then the kids yeah. are having to go further away for school yeah. and stuff like that. They're really wanting more children yeah. born here. I so. think if we had like eight kids and they'd love us. <laughs> <laughs> then we have five furries. <laughs> Jeff Jones asks, considering Ewan's current predicament with his broken ribs, uh, what are the medical and pharmacy costs in Portugal? Well, as the broken ribs, I didn't actually go to hospital. I, I'm quite lucky. My, my sister's a paramedic and my mum's been in the NHS for years and years and years. So I spoke to them and they basically advised me that there's not much the hospital could do. They'd just give me painkillers, which I already had. So rest and recuperate. But we have used the health service and we've used the dental service. Both were absolutely top notch, really easy to use super friendly we know nick and andrea and andrea had to have a hip replacement and by all accounts it was easy like in and out two days or one day even yeah and i think the costs were very minimal it's mostly yeah. admin costs. it was like two euros 50 or something yeah like, an x-ray just yeah. just because of the paperwork they're very cheap here they have a national health service which is yeah is but it's a really modern health service mm -hmm. like yeah. the dentist as well was incredible yeah. Yeah, so yeah, all really good. Yeah, highly recommend. Pharmacy, the uh, painkillers are quite expensive here, aren't yeah. they? Like you can pick them up for 99p in Tesco's back home. Like 30. <laughs> yeah, whereas here I think it's about four euros yeah. a packet. But they come in thousand milligram tablets Maybe as well, which is interesting. You just take one of them. Anna Vazal says, how do you handle groceries, laundry and errands in the homestead? So uh, groceries, just like most normal people, we just go to the supermarket. We would like to start going to the market more. But we just always forget <laughs> the days yeah. on the might set an alarm or we pick stuff from the garden. Uh, laundry, we go to the local laundrette, um, hoping we may get a washing machine soon. And then we always try and hang it up to dry because it's always hot and sunny here. And then errands. Yeah, we just try and we do try and aim to have like one day a week where we chores try and, day. Yeah, chores day where we go and like collect water and make sure we've got gas and you know yeah everything Paula says uh, when are you getting a donkey and what will you call him or her you really want a donkey I, I will get a donkey <laughs> I'm always against getting more animals because it's it's it does make life work. complicated um, like it can't go away and stuff but exactly um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Thomas would look after a donkey for me <laughs> you're listening Thomas <laughs> as for a name I don't know because I like naming animals I think the current one, current favourite is Georges. 
yeah. the Portuguese version of George. I think that'd be quite a funny name for a donkey. But yeah, a lot, oh, that's a long way away. Yeah. Running water and everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah, long, yeah. long, long way away. Yeah, a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would, would be a brilliant. Yeah, it would be hilarious, issue. wouldn't it? <laughs> Kerry says, how's the mad pooch doing with his leg? It's actually he's, yeah, he's lying on the floor there. Lying in the sun, panting. Diogo, move out of the sun if you're too hot. <laughs> he's doing really well, as you can see, he's still quite mad. He's in a very excited young puppy phase. He came to Florence with us, him <laughs> and Frankie stayed in the hotel, and they were absolutely amazing. I can't imagine <laughs> his life experience from going to an abandoned hunting dog on the side of the road to a hotel in Florence was quite an experience. His leg's getting a lot better, he still does hold it up but the muscle is um, bulking out. We're really happy with yeah. his progress. We're hoping this year he might he might uh, develop an interest in swimming. Yeah. We can exactly try and force really good, it into him. Really good for the muscle rebuilding, that's what the vet always said. But he doesn't really like water. He hates water. Yeah, he's doing great. He's really good. been a great addition to the family. He, we really need to fence in the property because he does like to escape and go run around with the neighbour's dog. But his recall is really good, fair yeah, play to him. really working yeah. on his recall. We're going to do lots of training with him. Yeah, he's an absolutely lovely dog. You he do speak? Cats. Do you speak? Seferino Canibano asks, Hi, why did you decide Portugal is it a better market? Yeah, we chose this region because the land was really cheap. We did want to come here first in the van back in yeah. 2018 yeah. and it was a, we never managed it when we were the south of France and we were discussing whether to go into Iberia or whether to go across the Pyrenees. Mm. It, there was a massive storm around San Sebastian which made us change our plan. Yeah. So yeah. that's number one reason I think we had Portugal in mind because yeah. we were looking at Bulgaria and Romania and stuff. They always seemed a bit too far from home whereas Portugal felt a bit closer which it's probably not. It's driving back to the UK, I was like, I didn't realise we were this far away. But yeah, we chose here because the land was really cheap, but also we had heard really good things about Portugal. We met a Portuguese couple when we were travelling in the van and they were just so lovely. Mm -hmm. Mariette Dallo says, are you interested in growing vegetables in a polytunnel greenhouse? Uh, well, I have a greenhouse, which I love, and this really helped me to get things going sooner. But I'm not sure about polytunnel. I've seen people have good success with them here to extend the growing season. So you've yes. seen a lot of them that have been like that have ended up taking off yeah. and being ripped to shreds yeah. or being battered by the sun. Yeah. So I have a lot to learn with gardening and growing foods still. So maybe eventually that that would be the conclusion I came to. Mary Bates also asking how do you do the laundry? Yep, yeah, we go to the local laundrette. Um, actually, most of the supermarkets have the washing machine outside. Yeah, there's loads around, isn't there? It's getting quite expensive though. Yeah. When we've, you can do, a, we go just once a week, so we did have loads of laundry all at once. But yeah, I think it's 10 euros now to do a big load. Yeah, another reason to get a washing machine. Mm -hmm. Karina Amaral, actually these two questions are similar, says, how do you stay without working? Um, and then Jenny A asked, do you earn enough from YouTube now to live off or is it just only to supplement your income? So. Uh, we don't sustain ourselves without working, uh, we, we both do work. I work as freelance illustrator and I have an online print shop. And we, me and my mum, have a, a tea shop in North Wales called Sabiant. Yeah, tea and coffee so, specialist. We'll leave a link in the description if yeah. you want some tea or coffee, it's amazing. So you do some remote work for her. But... Okay, where are we? Uh, this one. Okay, Peter Borquin. Any news? Respecting the land right behind your house, you said it wants for sale and you like the idea of buying it. Yeah, we do actually have another question about the land as well from Anne-Marie Cabrejos asking as well if it's still up for sale, how much, and maybe we can all start help to fund you purchasing it, which is really generous of yeah, you, thank, thank you. you. We... <laughs> We got their phone number and they left a digit off it. Yeah. So, but they did, we did give us their name. So we did try and track them through paperwork with a lawyer, but it didn't come to anything. And we've not seen them since. Yeah, we thought we'd see them with Olive Harvest, but that's not happened. Um, it's, it's not really something that's been a massive priority for us at the moment because there's a law in Portugal that with rustic land, the neighbours get first dibs. So if they did sell it to anyone else, we would get notified and we, as long as we matched the price, we would get priority in buying it. Yeah. So we've not been too panicked about buying it, but it would be a great addition because it's the back of our house. It's mm -hmm. just a small strip of land. 
uh, it may have been a miscommunication, but I think they said they wanted 10,000 euros for it, which is... Which they're not getting. Yeah, it's, it's too much for the size of it, and there's no building on it or anything. Um, but that that may have been the misunderstanding, but I think we would only be able to pay about 4,000. Um, Maximum. For it. They need to come and prune their vines at some point in the next <laughs> few weeks, so hopefully we'll chat to them then. Yeah, and yeah. Hopefully we will get back to you with some news. Yeah, come to an agreement with that. Gary Wilson. In order of priority first, example, visa application, land viewing, stroke buying, pitfalls, essentially to take with you when you finally move. Five simple steps to starting a new life off-grid in Portugal. Um, I guess we've kind of covered a lot of those in the earlier questions. Yeah, well obviously with visa application we didn't have to do that because we came just before Brexit yeah. um, so now I think that'll probably be your most important one because otherwise you've only got 90 days here at a time. Yeah. And as far as I understand it you actually have to start that process before you come to Portugal. Yeah, then look for the land you would like to buy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, it, it is, I think that is a real big challenge actually is like the order of things to do it because you might apply for your visa and then never find the piece of land that you yeah. like. So. As for the, the actual order to do these things in I it's guess it would, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it would de be determined by your ability to travel here and stuff regularly. Because I guess if you could come to Portugal on a recce trip, land viewing, buying uh, tips definitely go to the villages. Don't just rely on an estate agent to take you to a property. Do your own research on the area. Turn up on a Sunday morning to see whether the hunters are about. Stuff like that. Like, you, you, they're going to take you to a place to show it off at its best. If you want to see everything, go there as often as you can. That would definitely be my advice on that. As for what pitfalls, they're all going to be personal. There's, there's, there's so many yeah. potentials. I know so many people have had issues like we did with like not fully owning the house or there being discrepancies with the land because the land was divided yeah. quite complicatedly in the past and you can't actually do that anymore. Um, so yeah, I would just say really look out for information on the deeds and, yeah. and hope for the best. Gail H, what happened to the little black cat that you used to feed? Joao. Joao, he's still around. He's still here. Uh, he's very much a wild outdoor cat. Unless it's cold, he comes and sits <laughs> on the sofa. Um, but yeah, he's still around. Yeah, he's my favourite one. So. Sharon Doust, can you tell me more about Frankie? Age, etc. Well, she is a smooth-haired dachshund, sausage dog, wiener dog, depending on where you come from. She's a good dog. Uh, we got her in the summer of 2017, I think. Was it? Maybe. Yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, she's six years old. Her birthday is in January. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she has such a lovely nature. If you're looking for a dog, I would highly recommend a sausage dog. They can be quite stubborn. Um, one thing they are infamous for is barking a lot. So we really trained that or tried to train that out of her. She still does sometimes run off barking, um, but she used to bark at everything. She loves cats. She loves cuddles. She loves a long walk. She's very long. She's very long. <laughs> but yeah, she's the best. She's Polish. There's a good one for you. Yeah. She, she's actually a Polish dog. She, her name was Sonia. Yeah. <laughs> right. Kate, any plans for kids in the future? Okay. We have answered that one. Um, Patrick Carl Connick. Hi guys, what's the single ladies gentleman situation like as a single guy? Are there places that I could go on a weekend, say in Castello, and meet someone? I mean, we don't really know. We've not really got much experience in that. There is a club in Castello, there's yeah. a few bars, and um, Tinder is here, is everywhere, <laughs> and, and other apps like that. So yeah, there's there's lots of beautiful Portuguese yeah. people here. So. <laughs> All of the, the nightlife places in Castello Branco especially always seem to be busy. So. Yeah, yeah. Right then, Feliz Pete. I have a question about building insulation, as it seems that winters can be quite cold in your area during the night. Have you seen any solution to keep your house warm at night? I'm thinking proper thick walls, roof and double glazed windows. Would that be an option for you? How local people deal with it? Good question. So, I mean, the cabin, the, the walls are like 70 mil thick or something. They're, they're really thin with just like a woolen, what do you call it? Woolen insulation yeah. thing in the middle. So it's not meant for long, period of time. The barn, which is where we will be sleeping in the winter. Currently the walls are 60 centimetres thick. And stone. And stone. So they're pretty pretty solid. Obviously we will point them and fill them so that there is less airflow going through them. Log burner is probably the best way. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say lots of insulation and 
um, a dry heat like a log burner. Oh, it smells <laughs> me. We find it quite easy to warm this room with the log burner. It's keeping it cool in the summer is one of the big things. And I think also having these big windows self-facing is letting in a lot of heat, but is absolutely lovely the rest of the year. I think that the locals are just really tough. They're yeah. just like they seem to just be able to withstand all of this, I guess, because they've grown up with yeah. it. Yeah, they're um, in jackets and trousers in 45 degree heat. Yeah, they don't seem to mind the heat as no. much. And they're wearing the same clothes yeah. when it's two degrees. Yeah, um, I think the stone, the classic stone buildings are built for the extremes in temperature. I think the more modern, like the Natijolo block houses, really struggle with the temperature temperature regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, we've learned from Nick, insulation, good ventilation, and a dry heat for the winter. Ow, Samantha! <laughs> She's probably like biting on me. It's a vicious little kitten. Okay. Right. So it's the last question. Noddy Edwards, how's it going? Hi, Noddy. We can see all your comments. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, is your Portugal residency a living off-grid for the long term? Well, Portugal residency we get for five years. Hopefully they'll give us another five after. Yeah. And yeah, we would like to stay currently. Yeah. As for off-grid though, we're, what are we, about 800, 900 metres away from the closest electricity pole. And it would <clears throat> cost us quite a lot of money to get it down here. But if we spoke to our neighbours and we came to a solution, then it's not off the cards. To go on the grid. Yeah. But there's so much sun here that I think if you had a good enough yeah. solar system... Yeah, it all depends on cost, really. Yeah. But yeah, the desire to live off-grid isn't what brought us to Portugal or to this particular property. No. It's just... It allows you to live yeah. rural. And the more we've done it, the more I really enjoy it. I love that we find our own solutions and that we don't have to pay for... Yeah stuff so that's what i was saying about the the life we're building here once we've paid back the money we've had to <laughs> borrow to resolve everything the last couple of years you know we'll have no mortgage no rent no electricity bills no, no. water bills yeah, yeah. laughing so, yeah i think it's a good good lifestyle yeah um, we'll uh, wrap it up there shall we yes thank you so much for yeah. your questions i hope you have enjoyed this video if you have any more or we missed yours please do let us know um, and we'll find a way of getting you an answer um yeah i really hope it's helpful actually i think a lot of people are who have asked are thinking of moving here and things yeah. so. also thank you very much for your support over the last two years the yes. reason we're doing the q a is because we got to twenty thousand subscribers which is crazy yeah. to us yeah so um, it wouldn't have happened without you lot so thank you very 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 much and see you next week i guess yeah. <laughs> ciao <laughs>